and welcome to the Mill Creek View CEO Special with me, your host, Steve Abramowitz, where I interview the best business people and entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome back to the Mill Creek View CEO Special with your host, Steve Abramowitz. We are focused on the best businesses doing business in America. Today, we are with Larry Ward. But first, for more information about the Mill Creek CEO Special and the Mill Creek Stable of Podcast, visit us anywhere you get your podcasts or videos at Mill Creek View. While you're there, please subscribe so you don't miss a single episode of this amazing content and pass it on. And thanks for doing it. Larry Ward brings two decades of corporate, nonprofit, and political marketing and advertising experience to Political Media, Inc. as its president and CEO. Full disclosure, I'm a client of Political Media with the Mill Creek View, LLC. Larry burst onto the political scene in 2002 under the tutelage of world-renowned political consultant and Fox News contributor Dick Morris. Using Dick's political savvy and Larry's online marketing expertise, the two were able to influence several key congressional and gubernatorial races across the country. Since the 2000, since 2002, Larry and the political media team have revolutionized politics. Larry was among the first to execute internet, email, and social media strategies for political campaigns. He continues to lead the industry with cutting edge technology and the award winning marketing campaigns. In 2011, Larry expanded political media's market by working with the Washington Times to launch the first curated news portal for a national media company, times247.com. Currently, he sits on the board of directors of three internet and direct marketing companies, the Social Security Institute, and is a regular contributor to several political and new media publications. Larry is a New York City native and attended Dowling College, where he studied business and advertising. Welcome, Larry. Thank you for taking time to come on the CEO special. How are you today? Good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That's a long uh, bio. Sorry, I had to read that. <laughs> you are long and distinguished, so we are very happy that you took time to spend with us um, to talk about you and your career and um, your political engagement, um, almost like activism. Uh, tell us first how political media got started and why people and candidates choose to work with you. Well, we got started um, almost, like I said, almost twenty years ago. Before that, I was I was in in advertising and marketing uh, for. Uh, commercial endeavors and and uh, primarily in in uh, um, you know pri- primarily in telemarketing outbound sales that type of that type of business and in in around the the mid nineties we started to see you know some headway when it when it came to some of the do not call laws and different things like that and some legislation uh, so we started to get a little more politically active to to uh, you know, try and stay in business. The, the government was, quite frankly, in my opinion, trying to crush capitalism by uh, destroying, you know, some of the sales vehicles, some of the legitimate sales vehicles that were out there. And so we we started uh, getting engaged in politics and one thing led to another. And um, we actually had started an email marketing, like we, we've been in email marketing and, and web development uh, back in the day when it was called electronic mail marketing. Um, which most people don't even realize that's what it stands for, electronic mail. <laughs> um, and, and so we were back in the day doing electronic mail marketing uh, for corporations. And, and a client said, well, can you do this for politics? And since we were already politically engaged, it was like, absolutely, let's, let's go. And, uh, <clears throat> and we started working with a candidate in New York's 4th District. And his consultant happened to be Dick Morris. So, so we went uh, across country in 2002 signed up a bunch of campaigns. One of them was, uh, I guess, our highest uh, notable campaign was Mike Huckabee, who was running for re-election and was losing. He was down uh, about four or five points. And we sent out three email blasts that were written by Dick Morris and pushed by by our technology in, in the state of Arkansas. And each blast that we pushed showed his poll numbers rise about a point and a half. So we knew we were on something special. I mean, by the way, that's never happened since you know, we he got so many emails back from those campaigns, thanking them, thanking the governor for, uh, you know, for taking the time to write them personally. And now when we send out emails for uh, candidates, typically it's get me off your list, just spammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has become so, saturated. It's a completely, different, completely different attitude. When did you realize politics could be a business opportunity? Well, I never really looked at it so much as a business opportunity other than a, a, a vehicle to allow 
candidates and causes to get their message out. Um, email has always been, you know, a, 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 you know, I've heard for 25 years that email is dead and social media is a thing, that email is dead, searches, that the inbound marketing is a thing. But the truth is there's really no, um, uh, there, there's no uh, replacement for email marketing. It's, it's one of the most effective uh, means of communication. It's, the, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship that you have with your customer, you have with your constituent or, or your voter. Um, and, and so it is, to this day, one of the best types of communications out there. And economically speaking, compared to, say, U.S. mail or some of the other things that we do, the door-to-door, -door, uh, ballot, not ballot dropping, but the uh, flyer dropping that candidates are forced to pay for right. to do, can't beat it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's more and more difficult every day. You know, we, are, we have the headwinds of, of not only politics and, and, you know, having some of the cancel culture stuff that's going on in the, in the country uh, that we have to constantly deal with uh, people getting knocked off of networks because, you know, they, they say something that is quote unquote, not establishment, but we also have to worry about, you know, the, the ever changing uh, rules of the road in terms of email delivery and making sure that we're, we're, we're keeping, you know, our part of the, uh, our part of the bargain, making sure that we're delivering good, clean email to people who want it and that type of thing, um, honoring our unsubscribes, all of those rules. But, those, but, you know, when you're, when you're delivering lots of mail, you have, you have the, uh, you know, the issues that, that come up in terms of, uh, you know, just getting blacklisted for uh, breaking a rule or a client breaks a rule in terms of the type of mail that they're sending or the type of people that they're sending to. Uh, but but you have that added added uh, uh, problem with cancel culture. It becomes a very difficult medium. And, and but it, thank God it's one that we that we've been uh, pretty good at. For, what, for what used to be the do not call list uh, morphed into filters, and so there's a little bit of that, but not yeah. as uh, prevalent probably as not able to call a home. Uh, last right. year, last year was a midterm election year. Next year is a presidential year. I assume this year is probably a little down. But what did you do in terms of volume and emails last year? Billions? A lot, billions, uh, a lot. Um, and, and look, we, we we our business isn't just in campaigns. It's it's also in in media and and organizations and things like that. So. Uh, yeah, we send we send a lot of email, um, and we get a very good result. You know, we have very good relationship with the ISPs that we send to, because we do follow the rules of the road. Um, but we do we do uh, you know tend to uh, you know send a lot of mail because you know it's what other medium does a conservative have other than a direct relationship with its voter? Uh, social media is is constantly throttling people or or um, you know, rate limiting them or, or not letting them, let, not letting their voice be heard. Um, uh, shadow banning is, a, is another term um, that happens. So, you know, you know and, and the airwaves, you can't run ads that, you know, that, that the, uh, the networks don't approve of. Uh, you know, we have one network, one major network on, on, on uh, you know, television, that's Fox. Uh, Newsmax and there's OAN, there's Real America's Voice, there's other networks, but there's really one that had some volume. And of course, you know, that's, we, we, there's not a real, um, there's not a real broadcast network that goes out there and, and pitches our, uh, and that allows us to talk about our issues, about our policies and our politics, like the left has. Um, and with know, hundreds of has, hundreds of candidates, sometimes thousands in a cycle, the ability to take the real estate of those radio stations that do conservative talk, you can't because then there's no programming, right. there's no ads, there's no anything else. So, yeah, very right. limited uh, channels for them to to distribute to. Um, off your website, you say representation of clients' interest as top priority, functionally and aesthetically creative and appropriate design. Over 20 years design experience, which that puts you back in the uh, infancy of the whole median. One-stop shop, concept, design, production, programming, hosting, public relations, and marketing. I found this interesting. No margins, complete service scope. I want to ask about that. Project management, balance design, cost and schedule, complete representation of client interest, custom solutions to fit your needs. Um, expand on any of that that you find most uh, wonderful about your job. I, I just love the idea that we can get into an issue or an organization and find the ways to target that particular market 
reach that market, use design, use copy. You know, obviously right now AI is is the big thing, right? So so they're, you know, we're we're taking advantage of what's there, you know, with with AI in terms of copyright. Obviously, uh at this point, um, I would say AI gets about 80% of the way there. Uh you can put in a thought, an idea um into into AI and it can it can help you design stuff, it can help you write. Um, but it's 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 about crafting the message, but it's more about knowing what message is going to resonate uh to that audience. What you know, the, the, the science behind design, what's going to capture their eye, how are you going to drive them to the call to action, how are you going to get them to act, and then once they act, how are you going to keep them involved? And so that, that's all part of the, uh, you know, the marketing science that we, that we deliver for our clients. Well, and I think when the history books are written about the 90s, or at least they get tired of talking about it in the final books, Dick Morris will probably go down in history as his triangulation strategy, right, where he was a Democrat, working with Bill Clinton, the Democrat, to basically come to the middle and work with the Gingrich Revolution and whatnot. Do you, do you work on all sides or do you have a certain um, political? No, we, we, only work on, we only work on the right. Um, although, you know, uh, quite frankly, and, and it is, it is um, a little bubble politics. You know, we, we're, we're reaching out to conservatives to get them out to vote, to get them, you know, engaged in the campaigns and the advocacy. And then we hope and we, we count on the conservatives to go out and persuade their friends who are liberals giving them their talking points and, and being able to reach across the, the aisle. The, the ability to reach, unfortunately, the ability to reach the other side with our, with our message policies and politics is, is even, even an email is very, very difficult because you start getting complaints. So you send something to, to, to a bunch of liberals who, you know, you, you might want to persuade on a particular issue, but they, they're, they're so um, ingrained like the board, you know, they, they, you know, you're, you're the enemy. We're the enemy to the left. Right? You know, it's, it's uh, Dan Bongino says all the time, he says, you know, we think they're uh, the, the left policies are bad. The left thinks the right people are bad. So they think we're evil. Right. Um, and we just think that they have bad ideas. So we want to help give them our good ideas, you know, and, but the problem is, is that they'll click, complaint they'll unsubscribe they'll try and hurt your reputation um you know they'll they'll take the social media and and try to cancel you so you can't really talk to them so by because of that um you know we rely on everybody else you know to to you know person to person take the messages that we're trying to present you know in our marketing campaigns and take them out to your family and friends and and, and you know you yeah, talk to them over over a beer or over over Thanksgiving dinner. If you're submitting moderation and the far right or left aren't interested and they call it spam, obviously that's that 80% that you said AI will get you. The last 20% is going to have to be the politician himself or herself on the street shaking yep. hands and changing minds, which is their job ultimately. 100%. Um, I love your vision statement. Political media will reach billions of people with our message of liberty through all communication vehicles. We will innovate, lead, and remain on the cutting edge of technology in pursuit of our mission. I find things like Win Red or Act Blue fascinating as as business models. Let's say this is a business show. What are you seeing coming down the road in terms of new technologies for getting that message out? Since it is an ideas median, uh, whether you're communicating on email or talking on a stage at a speech or a rally, what do you see technology doing in the future for this same platform of, of retail politics? Well, you know, like 30 years ago when the internet uh, became prevalent, you know, about 1995, people started, you know, having internet on their on their desktop computers. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just talking uh, the time. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> people people started, um, you know, having internet on their computers. It, it revolutionized the way we do business, the way we communicate, the way we shop, the way we think. Um, you know, the way we socialize, all of it was changed in 1995. We're in that, we're in that time period now with artificial intelligence, um, with, with these language models and the things that, um, you know, GPTs can do. Uh, it, it, we're, we're in kind of a, 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 that big of a moment, whether we realize it or not, everything is about to change. Everything is changing very, very rapidly. And we are at an information war at a pace that is um, much, much faster than it's ever been. The problem with AI 
And the real opportunity for conservatives is to develop their own tech. And that's something that we've always preached is we have to have our own tech. We, we built our own tech. It's called conservative stack. So if anyone wants to go to conservativestack.com, you'll see all of our uh, tech, our email platform, our content management systems, um, you know, our, our uh, database products, our CRMs, um, and, and we're building out AI as well. Uh, but the, the AI um, is so biased the Silicon Valley version of, of AI, this chat GPT, is so biased to the left, it's it's very dangerous. I'll give you an example. So you can do this yourself, right? Go to chat GPT and ask if man-made global warming is a fact, right? Now, you could say global warming is, you know, is man-made, and you could say that as a theory. There is, it is not a fact. But if you go and you you go out and you say man made is man made global warming a fact? ChatGPT will say yes, it is a fact. Then ask follow up in the same conversation. You could ask, um, is why is man made global warming a fact? And it will say because a consensus of experts say so. That's really pretty much the answer it gives you. Mm. And then you can you can follow up and say, does a consensus of experts equal a fact? And the chat GPT will come out and say, no. So then I re-ask the question, is man-made global warming a fact? Yes. And it goes around and around and around in that loop. And it will not ever say that man-made global warming is not a fact. Why? Because it was programmed not to. This is not a free-thinking chat GPT that's going to get information and make, make conclusions. This is a program. Uh, artificial intelligence that is skewed to the leftist ideology, and and y- while while it does incredible things, if it's not political, when it comes to politics, this Chat GPT is is so far left, it's dangerous. Yeah, it's no different than Wikipedia, really, only faster, and you can uh, know that the programmer, the human being somewhere on planet Earth, put that in there because they were told to. So it's garbage in, garbage out, like we said. Now. That's a great segue to what I wanted to ask you. You say on your website, political media will do well by doing good. Quote, if the world is worth saving, it is worth saving at a profit. Microsoft owns ChatGPT for the most part. That's the, the, the backbone of it. Can you develop a profitable alternative so that people don't have to rely on ChatGPT as the one and only source of all things good, like the w- wizard behind the curtain? Can you have a profitable chat GBT with the knowledge of your company? Absolutely. Not, not, not just me, but other people can as well. I mean, look, the, 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 the chat GPT is an open source project. Now that doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want with it because, you know, th- there's a company called Tusk, uh, tusksearch.com. And they came out with the Gipper AI. And all it was, was chat GPT, but instead of skewed to the left, they trained it to be skewed to the right. And ChatGPT shut it down. They won't let them use it. Uh-huh. So uh, most people think that you 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 know you, it's open source. You can build on top of it and make it what you want. There are some rules, and and they you know they they basically yanked that from from Tusk Search. So what what we have to do is not rely on their databases, on their tools. We have to build our own tech from the ground up. Which you and have. you know the most important thing that that requires. Yeah, we have on our products, but the most important thing that, that requires. Is um, is investment, right? You, people need to put their money where their mouth is. If you want to really make a difference in the world, and you're in, you're in business, you're in the tech business, you, you have programmers, you have you have the ability to create these things. You need to um, to to put the investment in to be able to build this. And look, it could cost billions of dollars to create an an alternative to ChatGPT, but it will be worth it. Uh, because we can create it better, we can create it where it's not biased one side or the other, and it could be the product because we need to compete in this space. We can't. My my three word BHAG. I, I'm sure you understand what BHAG is. Big hairy audacious goal from Jim Collins mm. is is crush Silicon Valley, and I don't want to crush them. I don't want to crush them in in in. Uh, Politically, I don't want to just make make them, uh, you know, have politics put their put their thumb on Silicon Valley. 
uh, with the with the Section Two Hundred and Thirty thing or anything like that. Let them let them compete. I want to I want to beat them in the marketplace. That's the way that we actually win is we beat them in the marketplace, and I believe we can. You know, there are a lot of very very smart programmers who are not bought into that leftist uh, ideology who can come together and build build some of this tech. And like you said, that quote that I use is actually not mine. It's it's uh, Milton Friedman's son, David Friedman, said, if the world is worth saving, it's worth saving at a profit. And, you know, saving the world can be very profitable if you if you do it right. And, and you know, you should earn profit by saving saving the world from from communist dictatorship. Yeah, and one thing I've observed is that liberals spend very liberally and conservatives spend very conservatively. So when it comes time to raise that capital and do those things, there's a lot of yelling and screaming. And yes, they will show up at a school board meeting if motivated, but writing checks is a little harder. Um, so back to your business, short-term goals, attract extraordinary, talented, passionate, purpose-driven individuals with the highest ethical standards to our executive team and board of directors attract $2 million to invest in next generation communications technology. That might be outdated, but maybe you've already done it and then let me know. Attract a stable of clients that share our passion for your mission. Develop and execute cutting edge media and marketing strategies for your clients at Advanced Liberty. Create a strong and sustainable return on investment for our investors and stakeholders. Still your short-term goals or have you accomplished some of them? We've accomplished some of them. Actually, we haven't needed to take any investment. Uh, thank God our business has been growing. Uh, pretty well, and we've been able to invest, you know, that kind of money and more back into our into our products and our suite of uh, marketing uh, technology, uh, and so that that's that's been a uh, you know a real blessing. But yeah, th- those are still our goals, and and hiring is is super important, hiring the right people. And thank God, I have a great team uh, that hires a lot better than I do. <laughs> uh, tell us about your team. It's a, yeah, we've we've got a great we got a great team, and we have people all over the all over the country in different. different we have an office in San Marcos. Uh, we have we have people in Florida, uh, 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 New York, um, Texas. We have uh, folks that live in Americans, expats that live in. Uh, actually, they're still citizens, but they live in Costa Rica because you know it's nice down there. I guess that's, that's what I've heard. Cheaper too, yeah. The, the the, nah, the 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 bugs are too big for me, so I no thank you. I, you know, so New York's Virginia, got so some got big bugs. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> they do have big rats. Yes, they have big rats. Everything's bigger but, uh, in New York when it comes to the the rodents and the insects. Not necessarily like yeah. Texas, the stakes. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly, exactly. But it's but it's a it's a um, you know we got a great team. We've been we've been putting together you know about uh, fifty or so people right now, and I think we have a we have. Uh, a growth plan to double that uh, by 2024. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, branding and identity. Identity is who you are. It is how you are seen amongst your competitors. Your corporate identity directly affects all areas of your business and is a vital role in your potential customer's overall view of your business. Having a strong, consistent look and feel over all of your communications and marketing projects is the first step to building your brand and creating a solid image of your company. Your website, brochures, advertisements, and all other materials should be created in a manner that keeps with the consistent style and design of your brand, thus enabling customers to instantly identify with your message and way of thinking. Uh, give us a an example of how that worked. Uh, you probably can't name names for confidential reasons, or if you can, go right ahead if they give you permission. Tell us a, 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 a win in that area. Well, it always it always works. I mean, it, that's that's kind of like you know branding branding one hundred and one. You want to be consistent. You want to have a message that that tells you who you are, your identity, right? As as an enterprise, it's not you know, um, corporations are or at some level have to be personified in terms of have the same traits and characteristics of the people who are running them. And you know, our 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 objective when we're running running our business is is to you know get things done, to be available, to be to be service orientated, uh, to help. Uh, advance customers' goals. I mean, that, that's that's our identity. That's who we. That's who we are. That's who we we, we uh, strive to be. Um, you know, but our branding for political media, for example, our, our tagline is is uh, inside politics, outside the box. And really, if there's one thing, one one mantra that we've tried to keep, uh, it's that. And that's been a consistent brand for uh, political media for. 
for you know our entire existence is inside politics. In other words, we know what we're doing. We understand the political games. We understand, you know, the all the machinations behind the politics, behind the the, the parlor intrigue, and all that kind of stuff that goes on on Capitol Hill. Um, but we think outside the box, and and to get results, sometimes you really have to think outside the box. I give you some examples. So one one of them was uh, during the uh, Newtown. And this was this was obviously a a terrible um, a terrible tragedy. Uh, Newtown, twenty kids um, gunned down in a, in a school shooting, and two days after Newtown, the left wing mob was coming. You know, I, my office used to be right between the RNC and the NRA lobby office, and they're walking down the street screaming, "Shame the NRA!" So right, all instantly ready to politicize these deaths, instantly ready to uh, try and get some get a win for for their side on gun control, and they're walking down the street screaming, "Shame the NRA!" You know, and so I lifted up my third story window. It's actually the, my uh, Facebook photo. Usually, uh, I lifted up my third story window, threw my arms out, and screamed, "Arm the teachers!" Right. Because I saw it differently. You're going to come in here. You're going to try and blame the NRA. I blame the fact that, that it's a gun-free zone and that kids should be protected. And you know, and uh, so I'm screaming on the teachers. I look, I look down. There's 30 cameras pointed up at me. Um, so I'm like, all right, I'm making the evening news. It's going to be fun. So I went down and took on the mob and the whole nine yards. And then then we came back and we said, okay. So I had this emotional moment. And where, where I probably shouldn't have stuck my hand out the window and screamed at the at the mob, but you know, it was an emotional moment is what it was. And and I was I was um I was I was uh, in for a penny in for a pound. I came back up, I said, So how do we stop this? Because quite frankly, the, the Republicans I was speaking to at the time on the Hill said, There's nothing we can do. Twenty kids died, we're gonna have to pass gun control. And I said, you know what, the heck we are. We're gonna we're gonna do something about it. It's, out, it's outside the box, but we're going to call for a National Gun Appreciation Day. We put up a website. We put up a, a um, you know, a petition uh, to protect students and, and to appreciate the Second Amendment for what it is, which is it's there for us to uh, protect ourselves uh, against intruders, protect ourselves against people who would have us do harm to defend ourselves, and also for, to, to protect uh, the, the citizenry from a tyrannical government. And so we put up this 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 campaign, this gun appreciation day campaign. And as soon as I sent out the first press release and had the website out, it took about five minutes before I started getting calls from uh, every major publication. And it, within an hour, I had ABC, NBC, USA Today at my doorstep, uh, do, you know, having me on interviews because they, they thought well, 20 kids died. Here's a guy who's talking about gun rights. We're going to make him look like a nutcase. Unfortunately, they probably thought I was a nutcase. But at the same time, I was able to get my message out, particularly to, to the liberal, to the left wing media, and start a real debate in the country, which, which um, you know, turned out to be a massive debate. Um, and, and we had, you know, uh, I probably did more media in those two weeks than Kim Kardashian. I think I did. I think I measured it actually. Um, <laughs> <you> more, yeah. <laughs> it was it was on a Daily Show. It was on Saturday Night Live. Everybody was talking about Gun Appreciation Day and this gun nut. But what happened was we turned five hundred thousand people out on January nineteenth. Five hundred thousand people came out of their homes, went to gun stores, gun shows, um, or state capitals to uh, protest or to to celebrate the Second Amendment. And whereas Joe Biden, vice president, said, we get Brock and I guarantee gun control by the end of the month, we handed Obama his first, and at that time, his only loss uh, legislatively. They would have gotten gun control in, 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 uh, in 20, 2013 if it wasn't for Gun Appreciation Day. Real world results. Um, okay, in the remaining minutes we have, let's talk about this. Identities have simplified through the years to adjust to the faster pace of our culture. 
TV, movies, and video games, which is a larger market than movies and TV combined, all compete for the shorter attention spans of the population by advancing visual effects and packing their products with action and excitement. In this environment, your identity and branding not only has to stand out, but it needs to be simple enough that is recognized in the time you have the attention of the viewer. Studio Cyclone will work with you to discover your target market and create a customized corporate identity that honestly reflects your company. Tell us how political media helps folks like that. Uh, exactly that. I mean, look, we, we the videos, you notice the videos are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, that it, we, It's gone from the soundbite, you know, the two-minute soundbite to the 30-second soundbite to a TikTok dance. You know, and, and I got to admit, in, in, in 2022, I was one of the people laughing that all of these uh, Democrat politicians were – were doing dances about how they were going to, you know, protect abortion and saying, what are we, they're making fools of themselves. I mean, this it's disgusting, but they're also making fools of themselves on these little TikTok dances, but they were reaching that young audience. And unfortunately we've, we hate say it, we've dumbed down it with our educational system so much that long form doesn't work with this, with this, uh, with, with the, the new voters. You got it. You got to have everything in these, in these little TikTok uh, shorts or skits. Um, and so it, it, you, and you have to be able to, it's called the elevator picture. You have to be able to convey your message or communication in that short amount of time. And that takes, so, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Carter clues, who's, who's, uh, uh, one, one of my senior, uh, writers. He's terrific. He's, he's, he's a marketing genius. He's been around for forever. Um, his dad was a pastor and his dad used to say, you know, you know, I can, I can do a half hour sermon. I can prepare for a half hour sermon in about two hours. If I need to prepare for a five minute sermon, give me three days because it's harder. Uh, and it takes a lot more thought to condense a message than to, than to uh, push it out. So you have to have the time and discipline to be able to um, condense that message into a shorter, uh, into, into a shorter medium. Um, and you have to have the ability to know that you're going to get that desired action out of that shorter medium. And how do you get to that from the, from the quick 15 second, uh, TikTok video that you just put up. That's right. And it used to be bumper stickers, right? If you couldn't put it on a bumper sticker slogan, it wasn't good for politics because nobody wanted to hear a politician drone on for three hours like Bill Clinton first did at the convention his first time out. And, or I think Obama did the same thing. That could have been a death knell to their, uh, to the attention span of the voters. Whereas if they would have just had a bumper sticker, like, I don't know, don't ask, don't tell, you can actually sell. Um, bad example. Hope and change. Hope and change. There you go. Hopey changey. Um, you start with the logo or word mark. The logo is the first thing a person sees. It's the first representation of your company. This is where your identity starts. If it is not great, it could also be where it ends. With the mixed media culture we live in, your logo needs to be readily available on business cards, stationery, and envelopes, as well as simpler things such as fact sheets and billing statements. You need to be able to use your logo on the web, on mobile, and in video or other digital media. This is just where we are today. Who knows where technology will take us in the future, wherever that may be. Rest assured that Studio Cyclone will create an unforgettable logo that matches your company's vision, your bumper sticker message, or tagline. Remember, appearance is everything, right? It is, absolutely. And, and like I said, logo, logos are, are super important. It's, it's, again, what can you convey in your logo, like that bumper sticker, that immediately tells somebody, who you are. And I remember the days of the dot com boom and and you know in the, in the early 2000s and and probably most of your audience is is uh is younger won't remember that but in in the, I, I you'd watch those commercials and they would be of nonsense they were all artistic and then all of a sudden you'd see a logo on it and you you, you know I saw Super Bowl commercials I mean they paid 2 million dollars for this commercial whatever however much they paid and and at the end of the commercial you get a logo and you don't know what they do. You know, if, if, if you've got to, you know, you're just, I couldn't understand why they were spending the money. I mean, what are they trying to accomplish? The Nike swoosh um, can get away with that. Some drug that says right. it cures everything can't, right? Yeah. 
Right. You, you need to explain and, and at least say who you are, what your call to action, what, you know, what product or service, what need do you fill in, in the quickest, easiest way possible. And if you, if you can't do that um, in a logo, then you need to maybe rethink your logo. I, I like to brand companies in ways like our company name is Political Media. It's pretty easy to understand that what we do, we, we work in political media, political communications, political, um, you know, uh, media. I mean, that's what we do. It's, it's exactly what we do. Um, you know, the, the, the idea um, that you're going to name your company, uh, you know, 15 different consonants and, and, you know, some cute name or that nobody knows, are you going to make up a word? You got to spend the money to brand that. Hey, Larry, I really hate to do this, but the Zoom is going to cut you off hard and it's going to be sure. insulting if I don't thank you right now for all the time you spent with us and explain to us how you do this. It's so fantastic. I do want to give you a chance to talk about Constitutional Right Pack real quick, um, sure. maybe 30 seconds. Yeah, it's our, it's our political action committee. It's it's a uh, we fight for all the constitutional all the constitutional rights that you have in the Bill of Rights from one through 10. Every single one of them we fight for. And that's your your right to free speech, the right your right uh, to to uh, Second Amendment, the the uh, your your right to a fair trial, all of them, all of them. We have we have rights, and if we don't fight for them, they'll go away. So we have to be vigilant. It's a republic if you can keep it. Absolutely well said, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, normally we use our paid for Zoom, so we're not a cheap show here, but today was a special case. So I'm really sorry that it will cut you off. But again, thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. You're going to be very busy in the next 18 months. we got a big election coming and um, I just really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to my book of the day segment where I show you a book you might enjoy and more importantly, apply to your business. The Checklist Manifesto, Atul Gawande is the author of three best-selling books, Complications, a finalist for the National Book Award, Better, selected by Amazon.com as one of the 10 best books of 2007, and The Checklist Manifesto. He is also a surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1998, and a professor at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Business Health. He has won two National Magazine Awards, a MacArthur Fellowship, and been named one of the world's 100 most influential thinkers by foreign policy and time. In his work as a public health researcher, he is a director of Adrian Labs, a joint center for health system innovation, and he is also co-founder and chairman of Lifebox, a global not-for-profit implementing systems and technologies to reduce surgical deaths globally. He and his wife have three children and live in Newton, Massachusetts. We live in a world of great and increasing complexity, where even the most expert professionals struggle to master the tasks they face. Longer training, even more advanced technologies, neither seems to prevent grievous errors. But in a hopeful turn, acclaimed surgeon and writer Atul Gawande finds a remedy in the humblest and simplest of te techniques, the checklist. First introduced decades ago by the U.S. Air Force, checklists have enabled pilots to fly aircraft of mind-boggling sophistication. Now, innovative checklists are being adopted in hospitals around the world, helping doctors and nurses respond to everything from flu epidemics to avalanches. Even in the immensely complex world of surgery, a simple 90-second variant has cut the rate of fatalities by more than a third. In riveting stories, Gawandi takes us from Austria, where an emergency checklist saved a drowning victim who had spent half an hour underwater, to Michigan, where a cleanliness checklist is intensive care units virtually eliminate a type of deadly hospital infections. He explains how checklists actually work to prompt striking and immediate improvements. And he followed the checklist revolution into fields well beyond medicine, from disaster response to investment banking, skyscraper construction, and businesses of all kinds. An, in, an intellectual adventure in which lives are lost and saved, and one simple idea makes a tremendous difference. The checklist manifesto is essential reading for anyone working to get things right. That's it for this episode. Really hoped you liked it. If you like what you heard here, be sure to check out our other shows, The Mill Creek View, Washington and Florida and Tennessee, where I host, and subscribe to mcview.us, the website. And thank you for doing it. Until next time, this is your host, Steve Abramowitz, CEO of The Mill Creek, Mill Creek View, signing off.